This is Duke University. It's truly wonderful to be here. Um, I wanted to begin by saying, um, I'm sure none of you remember this except me, and that's probably a good thing. But uh, in my job talk in March of 2011, I said as my second point, um, what would it look like if we broke down the walls of the academy a little bit more than we have um, building an ivory fence, even as we dismantled the ivory tower? Um, and that was a hypothetical, but one of the most uh, uh, deeply felt principles uh, I have about higher education. And uh, within my first year, in a conversation with Laurent, um, Laurent said, what would it look like if we, he didn't use the dismantle the ivory tower thing, but he did talk about exactly this initiative in um, what is now known as Scholars in Publics. And what I love about this is, um, I've only been here for two years, but everyone's talking about scholars and publics now as if it's been here forever, um, which is a, a tremendously wonderful thing. But um, I've come up with a new category called the Duke moment, which is when you have an idea and everyone around Duke is so excited and engaged and far more intelligent and educated than you about the idea that they just go with it and you have no choice but to say all righty then and and move forward and i would say my absolute first duke moment was this conversation with laurent um, and we were able to make it happen in a, in a really extraordinary way create the space for it um, so i would say this is probably the most exciting thing uh, to watch blossom uh, at Duke uh, since I've gotten here. And I think that with nurturing and care and engagement in all the different ways that <coughs> I know faculty will be able to, and staff and students uh, will be able to contribute, uh, we can uh, really create a different kind of university slowly, slowly, as they say in India. Um, I want to make sure that the worst enemy of uh, change sometimes are utopian expectations. So um, uh, I, I think that this is an extraordinary beginning for all of us to, to think about these questions together and to enact these questions together. Um, and I think the question of the university in the 21st century um, is a question of both making knowledge matter in all venues and assuming knowledge matters in all venues. And those are two different ways of thinking about it. Um, and scholars and publics, uh, under the really wonderful leadership of uh, Laurent Dubois, Lou Brown, Mark Anthony Neal, Megan Vanell, and Aaron Kutnick, which is already a wonderful little community that is congealed around this, um, it, th these folks are going to help make that happen with everyone else in this room and this distinguished panel that, that um, I, I'm honored to be a part of now. Um, and they're already reaching out to so many different departments, to the Center for Documentary Studies, to institutes, to high schools, to Duke-Durham partnerships. Um, and I think the idea here is to involve the public in places where faculty live in their research and their teaching and to involve that research and teaching in the public sphere. It's a very straightforward equation in a certain way. But what does that mean? I think that means two things, both translating the work that we do almost simul simultaneously for the guild and for the world, and that's an, uh, a way that I think is very important. How can we train our graduate students to think through the guild and the world together? Um, and n never mind the world as an afterthought, right? The world can no longer be an afterthought for us. Um, and to write in such a way that we might be accessible to both. Um, my comparative linguistics professor in, at the University of Chicago, um, who had a license, he knew so many languages that he had a license plate game where every single letter, uh, combination of letters on a license plate 
um, he saw on the highway when he was driving. With the addition of one vowel, he could make a word. That was how completely obscure his knowledge was. And he always was able to do it. He never wrote a lecture that he, uh, he so he said, and I listened to many of his lectures in Old Irish and in Sanskrit and many other things. He never wrote a lecture that his mother couldn't understand. And, and he was committed to doing that in Indo-European linguistics. Um, and so I think if Eric Hamp, uh, my, uh, uh, my beloved teacher, can do that, then all of us can do that. And also, it is to co-create with publics, to co-create the work we're doing in a variety of different ways, whether that's crowdsourcing our research, um, thinking about artistic uh, uh, renditions of our research in the way that the post-colonial critic Talal Assad talks about. You name it, um, these are possibilities. And finally, I think we need to understand that we work with multiple publics. I think there's a kind of demoralizing depression as soon as we uh, think about the public as if it were a monolith. And so many of the people on this panel and in this room know that that is exactly the opposite of the vibrancy of public engagement. It can mean the church basement. It can mean the State Department. It can mean the Library of Congress. It can mean, um, you know, the corner shopping, shopping mall. So. Um, I, I, I really uh, I'm thrilled that um, all of you are going to come and think often with us. Um, and while today's topic is open access of, as a movement, I also think the question of open access can be applied to the university as well. Um, we're going to be talking about the cost of open access today. Um, we now have green and gold open access. It, it has enough of a long history that now has colors, which I'm thrilled about. Um, we also have um, different kinds of degrees of open access, um, both gratis and Libra open access. All of these things are tremendously exciting. Um, but I think that in addition to thinking about those questions, we also um, need to be uh, thinking about the question of open access in, as a university question. How open and accessible is the university? Um, and I think we need to stake a claim in saying the following thing, that the university in being open does not give up its prestige, that the university in being accessible does not give up its engagements with the guilds. In fact, in my view, dismantling the ivory towers in doing so, universities might become even more prestigious and even more connected to guilds. That's what my hope is, is to really put those opposites together and by mutual engagement intensify both arenas. And I'll simply end by saying that one of my great heroes, Mahatma Gandhi, has been cited as a forerunner to open access in the following way. One of Gandhi's earliest publications, Hind Swaraj, uh, which was published in Gujarati in 1909, um, can be understood by some as intellectual blue blueprint of India's freedom movement, we know this. But the book was translated into English the next year with a copyright legend that read, No Rights Reserved. So I'll end with that. <coughs> I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Thank Laurie for her introduction. And we'll just get <coughs> at it. Uh, Kathy, Mohammed, Ken, Paolo, uh, all represent very different vantages and uh, investments here at the university. And in that light, I'd like to ask all of you to just comment a little bit on why you're invested in open access. You know, what does open access mean for you and the work that you do and the institutions that you represent? Um, and, and what does that look like for, for you? Yeah, um, my investments in open access are multiple. I, I've been running a, uh, with a team of wonderful people, been running a, uh, uh, an open learning community, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, called HAYSTAC, which is an acronym invented at the National Science Foundation that stands for Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory, but we just say HAYSTAC. Now has about 12,000 members. We don't, we don't set the direction. People who are members of the community set the direction. We've only had to take about five trolls off it since 2002 <laughs> when we wow. began, which is kind of amazing. So that is, uh, those are, that metaphor is a metaphor for open access. Something about that community translates norms, and I think that's a good thing. The inverse is communities always translate norms. Open access is not de facto open. 
And my newest passion is who gets left out from open access for reasons not just of bandwidth uh, and privilege or censorship and other uh, what I'm going to call external contingencies, but what are the cultural determinants of open access? The most recent one that we've all become aware of is an organization I've been part of this year uh, called FemTechNet, which has been exposing the, um, sec the gender biases and as well as sexuality biases on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, here's Wikipedia, open access knowledge source, the most amazing encyclopedia ever created in human history. Uh, you know, more users, more languages, more inclusion than ever. What's the participation of women worldwide? Between 9 and 14 percent. Now when you consider that globally women tend to be the teachers, the librarians, the knowledge makers, that only 9 to 14 percent of the contributors to Wikipedia are female is both an algorithmic issue and we've gotten, we've done some very good sleuthing to talk about the algorithms which, con which control the content of, of Wikipedia, but it's also a cultural issue. So I think um, maybe it's wrong to start with that, but before we even begin to think about open access, we have to think about the cultures of technology that promote uh, benefit are part of what open access is in a far bigger way than, a, than just a technological or technocratic uh, matter. These are deep cultural issues and I don't think you can ever talk about a technology that's a significant technology without talking about the re re rearrangements of culture or the reinstantiation of the oldest, most oppressive, most unequal uh, formats uh, that culture comes in. So scholars and publics is fantastic. We also ask to have to ask what the openness of scholarship and the openness of publics really means in actual experiential uh, terms. Who does or doesn't feel qualified and why? Uh, one of the algorithmic things about Wikipedia is they've got an algorithm that says if you're a woman, whether it's a novelist or a Nobel Prize winner, the word woman goes in front of your accomplishment. Like woman Nobel Prize winner, woman novelist. There isn't man Nobel Prize winner. Man, there's another algorithm that says if it's a woman, you have to ask about spouse, divorce, parents, and children. There isn't that algorithm uh, in Wikipedia that automatically generates a set of questions for men. If you have an automatic generation of questions, you have an automatic set of answers. And often automaticity is status quo. Right? So how we deal with that level of who gets to speak, who does speak, who feels empowered to speak, seems to me that's my passion these days in terms of um, my open access commitments. And I know that's not quite the same thing, but I think that's another important issue that we all have to talk about together. And I know Scholars in Public is exactly committed to those kinds of social justice issues. That's great. That was fascinating. <laughs> I don't know how I can follow that. <laughs> you will. <laughs> I know oh, you. Oh, oh. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> So my, my connections to open access come from two fronts, uh, one from the sort of the research and, and guild front, as, as Dean Patton was saying, and the other more from the, the teaching and the broader, uh, broader community front. Prior to coming to Duke, I was at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, which is a research university, but obviously doesn't have the same facilities as uh, you know, an Ivy League school or a Duke level school, things like that. And I recall, you know, in say the year 2004, there was a, a premier journal in my field called Molecular Ecology. My library did not get it. And there were many times when a paper would appear in that journal and I'd have the choice. I could either spend that extra effort to write to the author and ask them, do you mind sending me a PDF of your paper? Or I could just say, probably not worth it, I'm not going to see it. <laughs> so early on I, got, uh, I, I was invited to participate in, in the whole PLOS experiment, the Public Library of Science. And so I was an editor of PLOS Biology fairly early on and I'm on the advisory board since, the very, since before the inception of PLOS One associated with that. Given that sort of experience, I was very eager to jump on there because I said, I, I'm one of those people I remember I couldn't get it even at a research university. Now, that's within the guild and within you know, a research university. Imagine those people who are at, for example, Cedar Crest College up in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. They're going to have many fewer subscriptions to it. They're trying to do research and they're trying to be active in the guild and cannot see this sort of thing. Now, this is true not just in the context of publications, but in the context of data. And this is something that's coming out a lot more now that a lot of the data that, is, that was funded with billions of dollars of taxpayer money are inaccessible. That formally they say you must contact the author to get it. Sometimes the author gives it to you, sometimes not. Fortunately, a lot of fields, and, I, and I've been uh, associated with groups that are pushing this, so I haven't spearheaded any of them. Um, 
a lot of groups are pushing for mandatory archiving of all data associated with publications. And I think that's a wonderful thing because by having the data out there, you can actually check it. You can actually analyze it. You can find <laughs> other interpretations potentially that the original authors didn't see. So that's on the research front and the value to that is huge. Then you really need to be able to get this information and otherwise you can't get it. On the public front, uh, very recently I've been involved in, in a massive open online class, a MOOC so to speak. And the biggest shock I had right up, right up front from participating in this MOOC was the level of engagement of the public in this sort of thing. Just the, the amount of excitement from people worldwide to dive in and see this. And Daphne Kohler, one of the founders of Coursera, has a great video online showing these people you know, trying to tear down a building to go in and see the, the <laughs> university as its first opening. I first thought that was maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but after participating in this and the number of emails you get and the number of, of people who are commenting in these discussion forums who are just absolutely eager to see the kind of thing that we take for granted. We have going on in, in classrooms throughout this university. And there's a lot of people who just can't do that. And sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's because you know uh, they're just in a place where they can't get to it. But the demand for this is huge. And there's no reason why we can't share this without diminishing what's happening here at Duke. But in fact, as Dean Patton was saying, but actually enhancing what's happening at Duke. And I'll give you one, one final example before I pass it off. Directly as an outcome of my online class, I had a, actually a software developer who signed on this last iteration. And he, he wrote to me afterwards and said, I really loved it. I loved Genex and Evolution, go figure. <laughs> and um, what could I do to contribute to this? And I said, well, you know, what would be really nice is to make an app that would be associated with this class that would help students at Duke and at other places learn this material. And he's made it. It's in iTunes right now. Go into iTunes right now, search Genex and Evolution. And he made a really, really nice thing that is directly benefiting not only the world's community, but Duke here. So that's just another example. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a publisher, so I, I come at this in a very different way. Um, but also a publisher in humanities and social sciences. So Duke University Press uh, breaks even. We get um, about 3% of our uh, budget comes from the university in the form of paying part of our rent. But otherwise, we basically break even to distribute scholarship. And that's a very precarious thing. And in humanities and social sciences, where the research, however that's funded, and the publication could be four or five years of writing, thinking, theorizing, rewriting, rethinking, re-theorizing apart. The kind of work that we do to kind of midwife uh, work that's done by humanists and social scientists who might be at Duke or might be in Australia or might be in South Africa is a kind of work that could never pay for itself. So in a way, what we have in a kind of reasonable priceness is a way to try and keep breaking even so we can keep doing what we're doing. So I, I've always had a kind of ambivalence toward open access because a lot of the theories about it have come exactly from the science sorts of things where a university is charged some ridiculous amount of money by commercial publishers to try and extract as much money from the universities as possible and then people who have, don't really have humanities or social sciences in mind or misconstrue it as being more like the sciences than it is assume that the same things that would work in those areas would work in these areas as well. And it's hard to address that without seeming like, oh, are you opposed to openness? Are you opposed to free circulation of ideas? No, I'm, I'd actually be for free housing. I'd be for free food <laughs> for the hungry. Um, and if somebody were paying for the books, instead of them being $25 for a book, I'd be for them being free. Um, but it's a very difficult situation at this kind of moment. On the other hand, what we do to circulate Duke's name and kind of the scholarship that's produced and edited here the, around the world is pretty huge. So that anywhere I've ever gone, whether it's in Singapore or Japan or Australia, um, people have read the books that we are producing and my kind of interest in actual the openness is how you get ideas from elsewhere to be available here. So this is my second part of it, which is I know I can publish something by someone who's chair of romance studies at Berkeley and not sell <coughs> enough to even a third cover its costs. But it's the person's work, it's important work, so uh, that seems like a worthwhile thing to do. 
So then how do we get ideas that are coming out in Sri Lanka visible here? How do we get ideas in humanities or social sciences that are being thought around the world that don't match the kind of modern, US Anglo modern, of like what the ideas and the disciplines are to circulate here and to be understandable in a situation where even the <laughs> things that are produced here with the networks here to support them are so precarious. So I've been kind of interested in what forms of packaging, what kinds of ways of showcasing work could make the circulation <coughs> go the other way. At least as far as I can tell, US-based intellectual production isn't really under um, delivered to the rest of the world. <laughs> it's actually pretty available. But getting us to be able to understand other ideas that are structurally different is really a challenge. So that, that's one place that I have a very different interest coming in. Paolo? So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, I'm recovering from an illness, so my voice is not so great. But <coughs> so I, I work in a library, and particularly the um, intersection of libraries and technology. And um, so I come look, look at this um, from the perspective of the opportunities that we have um, with the, the new technologies are bringing us. And some of you have already talked about some of this. But uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of a, a quote that I read that's been attributed to George Bernard Shaw. And I don't know if he really said this or not, but I like it. So I'll repeat it to you, which he said, um, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange apples, then we both still have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange ideas, now we both have two ideas. And so when you know, we're talking about breaking out of status quo, we're coming out of a model where um, the exchange of knowledge had to be like exchanging apples because the knowledge was tied very tightly to the physical containers of that knowledge. The, the technologies we have now allow us to make it more like the exchange of ideas because the cost of sharing um, that unit of knowledge with one person or 10 people or 10,000 or 100,000 people, the difference between that is very small. So I think it, it forces us to ask the question, if we could do that, and if it served the, the goals of the university better and the goals of scholarship better and the goals of the scholars better, why wouldn't we do that? And, and then it forces the question, the kinds of things that you're asking, how best do we pay for that? Um, we all know that nothing is free, right? But there are some things that we choose to share the costs for because we consider them to be a common good. So we're all sitting in this room today here, and we went out and got some drinks from there, and those drinks to us were free, right? But, but somebody paid for them, um, <laughs> Laurent or, or Patton or somebody, right? Um, in, the, in the software world, you know, they talk about um, free as in freedom and free as in beer, right? And so um, it, it was free as in beer, but it's free for us to consume, but obviously it costs somebody to, to make the beer. But we've chosen, somebody chose, somebody decided that having free drinks available um, was important to um, help stimulate a conversation here. And none of us paid for tickets to come into the room. And somebody decided that if you charge tickets, maybe fewer people would come and the conversation wouldn't be as good. Um, and so we've decided somehow as a community that there are certain things that we are willing to um, pay for as a public good rather than as a market exchange. And um, So no drinks and charge tickets now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and so I think that it raises the question, I think it's something we, I hope we'll discuss here today, is where does scholarship and what kinds of scholarship fall on different sides of that line? What kinds of things really should be market exchanges because mm -hmm. um, they benefit from that um, mm -hmm. and they, that the, the you know, traits that come out of that match the, with the values of the universities and the values of the people who are actually creating the scholarship and what things would actually serve all of us better and the publics that we don't know and might not know and can't imagine if we changed that model and broke out of a status quo and did, you know, agreed to cover the cost for these things in some kind of um, public way instead of as a market exchange. So let's set aside Muhammad's argument for a moment, right? It, because there's a, very much a logic to that, that, <coughs> that as Ken said, might not be applicable. Ken, you're in the business of selling books. You know, are people going to be willing to pay for one of those beautiful Duke University books because they are beautiful, you know, if they could access that same information for free, right? And, and, and this is not a new conversation to the mm -hmm. university, right? And all of us at various points in our career have been at that point where we've been photocopying a book, <laughs> you know, and making copies for the 15 students in our class for, for a range of reasons, right? So, I mean, that's not a new dynamic here. But, but I think about, there's a story, for instance, that's taking place, and this is something that Kathy brought up in an email exchange earlier this week, 
uh, of, of, of a black woman who's a scientist, and she does a popular science blog called Urban Scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and another online site wanted her to contribute to her blog, to their blog, and she said, well, I'm willing to do so, but I'd, I'd like to be paid for it. Um, so she declined when they said, we, we don't pay. Um, and, and of course, the why the story has become a story is that she got a response from an editor at the blog along the lines of, are you an urban scientist or are you an urban whore? Which is the only reason why this story comes up. But in the context of our conversation, you know, what does it mean for scholars, particularly in the humanities and the, and the social sciences where there aren't huge grants, right, where there aren't labs that are being funded by corporations where, you know, when, you know, every November, every October and March, when my royalty check comes in, <laughs> right, that, that's going to pay for something immediately. Right. Um, so, so what does that look like, as, as, you, as you mentioned, Paolo, in a kind of free market reality, what does it mean when open access could also mean free? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty interesting, the, the form that ease plays in that, the ease of getting something for free. So that making a cassette tape of a record for somebody was a barrier that just going and downloading something from a pirate site is not. Xeroxing by having to turn each page was a barrier that <laughs> right. may, that getting a PDF a is not. A PDF, right. yeah. But actually, that's not ac though. Those differences in reception aren't uh, really about the econ changing economics of the situation of producing the things. They're just about the ease of getting something for free, like if they didn't have any security guards at a store and you just could like walk in and walk out, would we do that? And would that be a good thing? And so the, the really um, challenging part is I feel like many people in principle would say, oh, I'll pay for the indie record label to help support the artist who's like trying to make it, but I'll download for free the things that are just big corporations and they're making plenty of profits. But in practice, once you start downloading things for free, then I think you forget that you had that kind of ethical intention in the first place. And to a certain extent, I think you can see that with books. Like people might say, conceptually, I know the difference between Taylor and Francis or Wiley Blackwell and Duke University Press or NYU Press. But if you get in the habit of assuming that most of the books you, you want to get could be found somewhere on some site in some PDF form, then that's what you're going to do. And I, I think you would need somebody like hyper principled to be like thinking through each thing they needed, which is uh, an unlikely uh, situation. At the individual level, I can see that. If we mm -hmm. did it at an institutional level, mm -hmm. can you imagine that, that that would be different? I mean, there are some, um, there's a project that I know Duke Press is involved in now called Knowledge Unlatched mm -hmm. that is um, taking the approach of let's understand from the presses themselves, maybe you can explain this better than I can, but or what is the, the um, cost of producing a book mm -hmm. in the way we'd want to produce it? Can we get enough universities or university libraries to sponsor the costs of production of that book? And if we reach that level, then the the e copy of the book is released as a Creative Commons licensed mm -hmm. ebook. Mm -hmm. If you want the print book, you still obviously got to pay for it. It costs to make it. Um, this is actually a great model, and it's a, a good story about <laughs> where people's principles and their actual economics diverge. So the idea was to have like a Kickstarter for books. So we say we're going to publish this book in anthropology. How many libraries would kick in you know, the uh, uh, price of the book so that we would make the book open access? And the model originally was, that's just the plain PDF. That'll be up open access. We could sell the physical book. You could have an enhanced e-book or something that was an EPUB that did more things. And so I thought that was great. And I think that lots of people would still get a physical book, uh, even if they could get a flat PDF for free. If somebody was teaching the book and they wanted to mark in it, there are lots of, lots of different reasons, or grad, grad students who feel like, no, this is my discipline going <coughs> forward, I actually want the book of this, and just people whose preferences it is. Just in launching the um, test pilot of this, uh, Francis Pinter, who's like, 
been tapped to reconstruct libraries in Eastern Europe by Soros. She's like a hardened negotiator. By libraries got pu pushed into free bundling. Oh, if we've bought any version of this book, shouldn't we get the credit for that Kickstarter fee? Mm -hmm. So somebody who, like, uh, we subscribe to Muse, and that book will be in Muse, so they're paying like $2.40 toward the book. Shouldn't we get the $60 credit? So the libraries, in principle, were saying, oh, we want to be for this unlatching. But then when it came down to whose budget was actually paying that fee and what are we getting, then we found ourselves in the position of like, oh, somebody's buying a paperback from us for $20, and they're getting a $60 credit that is helping to unlatch the book, supposedly by covering the costs. So I think it forms a sort of utopic ideal and the idea that you could come up with, um, several years ago, uh, our provost, Peter Lang and Kathy, uh, both came up with an idea of like, you know, university press publishing is a common good for any place that tenures people based on, on university presses. So why not get all the places <laughs> that benefit from those tenuring mechanisms to kick in, including, what was the little place? The, <laughs> But, yeah. Oh, where was the No, oh. not Louisiana. <laughs> oh, State. Cedar Crest College. Cedar Crest College. <laughs> so wouldn't, if you distributed the cost so that everybody was paying for the system, which was a common good, wouldn't that be a good thing? Turned out, everybody could see it was a good thing, but <laughs> no, who, had, who had the mechanism to actually make that happen? I don't list no. that one on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> it did not go anywhere. Nope. As we're talking about open access, let's talk about accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a very different conversation. Um, what does accessibility look like for you, right? What kinds of communities does that touch on? That's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can start one. Well. Sure. Uh, I mean, it, it very much depends on the product. If it's if it's a piece of scientific literature, the the argument that we tend to use is we are funded by taxpayer dollars. We, we get money from the National Institutes of Health or National Science Foundation. Taxpayers <coughs> are putting into it. There are a subset of people out there who may, may not even be in the guild, but really want to see this material. Mm -hmm. They want to see, you know, what is the product of this and does it relate, especially in something that's health related in particular. But what we do in this context is, is we publish it, and this comes back to the, the green and gold sort of publication. The National Institutes of Health has mandated that all, uh, all um, publications stemming from work funded by them have to be available 12 months after publication. So what we do is we actually put it into what's referred to as PubMed Central. Now this goes back to the, the comments that you were making in terms of uh, how easy it is to look at something. What goes into PubMed Central is not the nice formatted version. So if, let's say, for example, I was to write a paper. My paper is this double-spaced thing that's you know, maybe you know, 75 pages long. It's very difficult to read, but when it comes in a journal, it's this nice formatted 10-page you know, <laughs> document. It's the long version, which is what goes into PubMed Central, so there is still some added value to the, to the uh, publication quality one. However, that is available to the general public. On the other hand, it is open access green rather than golden, that it, it's supposed to come out a year after publication. It doesn't have to be immediately available. So that is better than nothing, yeah. to say that. Yeah. Now, if you're in the guild waiting a year, it's terrible. I right. mean, can you imagine just being perpetually a scientist who's a year behind? Yeah. No, no way. Yeah. That doesn't help you at all. For the public's good, it's probably okay. The, you know, the, there probably aren't that many people who are dying to see something that was published three days ago. Kathy? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think the uh, we don't live in a world where there are things you can generalize from across the board. I mean, I think it's very, very interesting how um, for lots of goods in the world, we have micro models of how they're going to function. But often when we talk about open access, we talk about it as if it's one thing, rather than in fact, like everything else, micro worlds of how it's going to function. How, I mean, one word then, I mean, people often say the hardest thing in the world is running a nonprofit, because you can't lose money, you can't make money. And how you get that right is not an easy, it's not easy, right? There are different things that compel you in a for-profit market, which is answering to your shareholders, act answering to your VCs, answering, answering to the people that support your product, um, but not for the sake of the community who are the consumers who are buying the product, but for the sake of the people who are investing in that profit for the, that product for the purpose of, of profit. 
in the knowledge ecology that we all live in, it gets pretty tricky. And what one small change in the factor, in the factoring, can can destroy a system. Uh, not for maybe not, although the dean would probably say even for elite universities like Duke, and we've seen that this year with financial aid. You know, income inequality has a real impact on elite universities that try not to burden their students with debt. That's a, income inequality is not just for poor people. Income inequality is not just for the poor people anymore. We've got a slogan here. Income inequality is for the repercussions across the society. I'm glad our Nobel Prize winner yesterday said it's the worst problem facing the world. I think there is some version of the ramifications of income inequality that apply to access as well. And that coming up with models can't just be information wants to be free uh, in either the kittens or the beer. Um, version of that that are open source coders, and I'm very, very you know, committed to open access. Um, but um, thinking about what those ecologies are and what the hidden costs of uh, the free is, um, is often something that um, is viewed very, very differently when you're from the, viewing it from the privilege of having enough capital to allow things, sort of the noblesse, ob oble noblesse oblige version of free, to, of free versus the penury. Uh, I have, I live in a situation of what social scientists call choice depletion. Uh, choice depletion is an incredibly powerful term that means every time you mean it, you make a choice in your life, you are depleting your physical, economic, health, mental resources because that choice puts you in a situation of precarity. And I think that many nonprofit publishers live in that world of choice depletion. And um, you know how you account for that ecology within the larger ecology, of course we wish knowledge were free to all, is really part of one of our burdens. I'm not a pessimist by nature, so I hate leaving on such a pessimistic note. I think we can figure that out, this out. I think there are ways we can figure this out. But one of the problems so far has been almost the classic problem of, pit, of um, pitting poor white people against poor black people. Uh, which is putting libraries against university presses. Both of those are service institutions designed uh, for an ecology of promoting knowledge uh, for the public good. Why those are often put against each other as adversaries seems to me cynical and bad and from an administrative, and I'm an implementer, so from an implementation point of view, a diabolical thing and something universities have to deal with and have to fix. So there, that, that would be my two cents on that. And now I'm just, um, I, I also want to make sure that when we think about accessibility, deans can talk, is that yes. all right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the deans are writing the checks. <laughs> I'm going to take my dean half, hat off for a second and sort of thinking about the public sphere. So in, in the writing that I've been doing recently about the public sphere, I've been thinking a lot about Nancy Fraser, who wrote in the you know, mid-90s, but her, her work is really relevant now in interesting ways, which is that we still don't have, and this is directly to, to Kathy's point, an, a good enough analysis about the contests that go on in creating a public or an, a sensibility of a public. And so w I was very much compelled by what Kathy was saying around what kinds of publics do we create such that there is, um, there is an openness to that public sphere. So you know, the big debate in theories of the public sphere is that the Habermasian understanding of the coffee shop is you know, the liberal white bourgeois thing, yay. I do all my work in coffee shops, and I don't experience it as a you know liberal white male thing anymore. Thank God. But there still is this way in which being allowed to speak and what kind of rules, implicit rules, are there for being allowed to speak is an interesting one. And and the question of accessibility is interesting around open access. So we I was the person that uh, created the open access rules at at Emory before I got here, and I did a little um, mini survey about women and their wish to think about uh, putting their work on open access and whether it, they had the same kind of reservations or engagements as men. It's very much to, to this point. And several uh, of the women responded, and this was not you know, overwhelming majority, but it was enough of a, of a distinct response that I noticed it, uh, that women felt that there was a vulnerability 
in becoming public um, in a way that the research community that they had built up and earned so in, in, in very difficult ways sometimes was, had become <laughs> at least trusted. So women had this attachment to the guild that was about the safety for women, which was fascinating to me, but not dissimilar to the work I do in India where women Sanskritists, you can teach, you can sing, you can perform Sanskrit if you're a woman, but writing and publishing, you don't go there because it's about vulnerability and it's about display. And those two things are very, very difficult. So that's, you know, I don't want to make global statements, but I do think as we think about the university and accessibility, one of the worst mistakes we could make as we move towards some kind of new model over the next several decades or century would be just taking the university out into the world <coughs> is probably not going to work because it's going to repeat yeah. exactly those prohibitive publics, if I could coin a phrase yeah. that Kathy was talking about. Yeah. In the workshop over the past year, Paolo and a few of us have had some version of this conversation that I'm going to kind of throw on the table. But, but how many of you recently have been to public libraries? <laughs> And, and what's your experience? What, what kind of experience do you experience at a public library? In, in which public library? That, that's, that, that, that's a whole, because that, that, that's another iteration of the question. So let's take the downtown Durham County Library off the table for a moment. <laughs> right. How many of you have gone to some of the more outlier branches, branches here in Durham in, in recent years? And, and, and what do you see at those libraries? Books, what else? Computers. computers. And, and what do you see at the computers? <laughs> you, you, you often see people in some long, in song <laughs> itineration of 30 minute periods of waiting to get access to a computer right. because there's no broadband in the hood. <laughs> It, it, because, you know, as we talk about open access issues, I mean, there are people who literally, if they could get to the information, can't do anything with it, right? right. Because how many PDFs can you download on your phone, <laughs> right? And how long does that actually take, right? So you have various people who are sitting around at libraries for the half minute, half hour period of time, and yet they're spending 10 minutes checking their Facebook, and they're spending 10 min minutes responding to the email that they sent the week before when they had their 30 minutes. Right? And they're trying to fill out job applications that they can't do on their phones. <laughs> and, and so how do we, as a university, right? and, and, and this gets to a real point in terms of, of the library, because even as we talk about access, what does the physical landscape of Duke mean in terms of access? Right? You know, if all those folks who are sitting at one of these branches of the library decide there's better broadband at Duke, <laughs> Right? Why don't I come over? And, and the irony is that a bunch of these folks actually have laptops, right? They just can't really use them, <laughs> you know, where they live. So what if all those folks decided to come to a Duke or a UNC? I won't even put Central in the conversation because, you know, they don't have access to the same kind of resources that Duke does. Um, you know, so what does that access mean for the library or a university in that context? I should just respond briefly. I, I want to hear what Paul has to say, but there is, um, I don't know what stage I need to tra check with Tracy Futhi, but there is an initiative, and maybe you all know about it, for Duke to share its broadband with a broader uh, community, you know, around its neighborhoods. And well, I don't much better than the city of Durham. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, I, actually, that's precisely the thing. So I don't know where that is, but um, she reported on it about six months oh, ago. So, but. Yeah, so I'm actually on the on the board of trustees of the Durham County Library, and uh, so I think about these issues from, uh -oh. from that perspective too. Um, and uh, the you know these issues that you're talking about are are clearly something that yeah. are continually important. That when you I mean there are obviously a lot of books do circulate from the public library, but um, the use of computers is a really important right. thing, and yeah. they those those spaces act <laughs> as um, community centers and resources, meeting rooms, um, meeting right. rooms. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't say more than, but I would say that, that role is equal to their um, use as an information resource. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that is really important, and I think that's an issue that, that we need to continue to think about um, when we're talking about access. Um, how that you know works with people coming to Duke, I'm not going to go there, but <laughs> I know there are lots of people from the library here, and that has been an issue in the past on campus. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>
I'm kind of interested the way the conversations often go between these two extremes. It's like the person at a, at a university trying to get really high level science access yeah, right. that you can't imagine that just somebody sitting on a farm somewhere like Googling around mm -hmm. and understanding this paper, although there are probably a few people like that. But it's really about <coughs> paths of access for high level researchers and then the access right. that's like just access to information. And the <laughs> middle always feels really cloudy to me. Mm -hmm. Like those yeah. two things are kind of at this distance. Mm -hmm. And then how to think about what constitutes the middle and what that would be and how to think about that in a more complicated way, I think is really, yeah. uh, in a way, the most challenging part. Mm -hmm. I'd like and to go back to the, the MOOCs. Yeah, actually, I was, I was going to make a comment because, in that yeah, regard specifically because that's it's, it's... That's where you're seeing a lot of them. Exactly. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not even that, bi I don't think you were implying it at no. once, but it's not really that bimodal either because no. there are a lot of people who will take these sorts of online classes. So I would just use mine as an example. Who would take these online classes and then say, I want to see other materials, and people would link to other materials. And mm -hmm. when they link to something, for example, let's say Science Magazine, which is, right. you know, subscription only, there would be this fury. Right, right, right. <laughs> so clearly there are a lot right. of people who are right. trying to get even some of that very high level, very recent mm -hmm. stuff. So you're right, it's, it's, it's very much a continuum and I, and I suspect there will be more in that middle mm -hmm. as time goes by, as the availability of understanding the material is out there more. But even the MOOCs model becomes a, an infrastructure issue also because you know not everybody's going to have the kind of access to broadband it's that true. allows them to actually participate in MOOCs. I, I mean part of the rationale, I, I, I run a tweet classroom, you know, in the sense that I encourage students to tweet what we're talking about in class. And part of that is because there's an interest for what's going on in the class, but if we were actually live streaming the class, a bunch of folks couldn't access the stuff, access right? Stream. But they can access it on Twitter or other forms of social media. So we're going to open this up to the audience now. I spend, I would say, 75% of my time now talking to people who, I don't know what their level of education is, but it's certainly not college professors. It's everything from CEOs to community groups to people in very, very, very underserved communities to uh, parent groups to students. So, um, and What's interesting is my lectures don't really vary much when I'm talking to the CEO of, of Cisco or AT&T and uh, an underserved community. And um, I find that fascinating. I think I'm sure things change. I'm positive. Uh, I could look at a video of myself and know which audience I was talking to by my vocabulary, my posture, my eye contact, the way I would lean in in a different way to an audience. But, but the message actually isn't that different. Um, and it's not that different from what I talk about when I, those rare occasions, and it is quite rare now. Uh, I actually gave a talk a couple weeks ago where I actually stood there and read stuff, and I hadn't done that in about five years. And it was really amazing to do this, to think, wow, I'm reading? I'm standing up here and reading words on a page and there are no images behind me? But I, that's part, that's, I know that's not a typical academic, but it sure is interesting. Uh, and it's certainly been enriching to my intellectual life in a way that I, I, I can't even begin to say how grateful I am for the kinds of uh, comments I get when I'm not talking to people who do speak the same language, who are part of the guild, and which means they don't really necessarily have to get to their assumptions. Yeah. I, I was thinking about Lori <coughs> talking about your teacher earlier. And so, you know, I'm a product of an intellectual tradition which is fundamentally rooted in this concept of make it plain. Um, if you think about Du Bois as someone who was trained in European philosophy, um, who could do the traditional scholarship, but, but Souls of Black Folks, you know, which I like to argue is the first black mixtape, you know, really was <laughs> him making it plain. Um, and, and one of the examples I take from is, is, you know, before we are having any of these access conversations, a figure like the late Manning Marable, 
who for decades uh, wrote a syndicated column, usually about 500 and 600 words, <coughs> so before the internet, that he offered to the black press for free, um, simply so he could be able to reach different audiences, right? And there are all kinds of examples of those kinds of traditions. And, and I think social media actually enhances our ability to do that kind of work at this moment. I think part of the interesting thing is getting out to different audiences and learning what you don't know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, last week I was in Frankfurt at the International Book Fair and some people had called a meeting of global university presses. The meeting was called by an association of Latin American university presses that I would bet no American university press people knew existed. They got the name wrong of the U.S. association. It turned out they had uh, social scientists there from Buenos Aires. There are 90 university presses in Argentina. Wow. Uh, that's wow. not that different than the number in the U.S. You know, so it's this very, the terrain or, you know, if you're in, it, we've been talking as if everybody's understanding English. You know, suppose you were publishing for philosophers who wrote in Thai. Then what's the group of people that you're publishing for? How big is that? How do you make that something that can be sustainable is a really different question than if you're writing in Mandarin or you're writing in English. You know, it, there's a whole lot of different things that you have to get out and address different audiences so you find out what you don't know. And I, I do think that your question has a um, dark side to it as well, which is that, you know, there, there are so many kinds of forms of knowledge that are being produced in the university that because they were uh, earlier shared with guilds that were public but also interestingly private, you know, in a certain sense, now that um, <coughs> things are much more readily available and commentary about things that are even published by university presses, are more re readily available, um, you're going to have a conversation with a readership. As a graduate student, you're going to need to be trained to have a conversation with readerships that may be uh, politically organized against what you stand for, period. And that's a reality that we really need to do a different kind of training for our grad students because it's, it's what I call, in what I'm thinking about, a disruptive public or an eruptive public is actually better. Mm. Uh, and that is, you know, a public that suddenly erupts around your, your work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's terrifying to a grad student because, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen to my work? But if we don't train folks to be in that public sphere, to assess the kind of thing, the conversation that's going on, and our universities to assess better what that eruption is and is not, then we will make um, really bad decisions about scholarship and um, about graduate student support as well as young professor support and so on. You know, that, that, I love that, that comment. <coughs> and it, it goes back to your comment too and it's, it goes back to what I said earlier about Wikipedia and algorithms. Uh, I have a MOOC that's going, registration mm -hmm. is going live very soon. That's an activist MOOC on the future of higher education, shaping the future of higher ed education, which I'm hoping will be a movement. We have about 50 classes around the world that are going to be doing face-to-face -face versions of the MOOC at the same time to try to get students galvanized to take responsibility for this. But before I would do it, I worked hard with the Coursera people on my ability. And my first, <laughs> my first, welcome to this class. And if you're a troll, you're going to get out. You're getting thrown out immediately. <laughs> I mean, there's, I really worked on having them change the algorithms and the procedures for how to get people off because women and people of color get blazed on uh, MOOCs if they say so, if their body looks odd or different than people want or too suggestive or whatever or if their skin color is not appreciated by the people watching and we know that and the participation of women and people of color as the teachers of MOOCs is far less than the participation of women and <laughs> people of color at the full professor ranks of our most elite universities. And part of that is because the public is eruptive, and unless there's a screen, unless there's an algorithm that says, get this guy off my MOOC right now, he's disrupting everybody's education by talking about me as a woman, unless we have those mechanisms built in, and that's sociology and that's technology, both. Unless we have that, you can't have a, you're gonna have an eruptive public in a very, very bad way. So I think there is both a, the, the flip side of these things that have to be dealt with. 
Certainly that, yeah, I won't even go into. Mm -hmm. Our recent history that both of us knew about in a different way than some of our other colleagues had to experience. Yeah. Yes. Um, given those comments, I'd be interested in your perspective on popular science's decision to cut off their comments. How um, interesting. From, oh, yeah. Um, oh, you should talk about that. How much role in the view affects people's understanding of the science? So, I mean, I'm familiar with that happening. I actually, I, I, I never read Popular Science. So I don't know <laughs> what actually happened there, but I, I did hear that that did occur. I mean, it's a tough thing. So it's coming back to what Kathy was saying. I mean, when I did my MOOC, so I, you know, my, my, my MOOC was on genetics and evolution, and I'll relate this to the comments. Oh, you as you can imagine, <laughs> the first week was evidence for evolution, and you can imagine there there were there were people who were disruptive to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, it, it was a tough thing because it's a, it's a fine line, right, where you don't want to come in and just say, I want to, I want to get rid of every contrary point of view. And uh, I had TAs associated with the class, and I warned them about that, saying, you know, the, the, there it have to be very specific criteria for what makes you go out. You know, crude language, personal insults, things like that. But just disagreeing in and of itself, even if not rational, <laughs> you know, it's okay. Just leave it there and let, let people decide. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I, I tend to, I don't know why I do think it's, it's a form of, of self-torture, but I, I tend to always, when I read a CNN story, I go down to the bottom and it's just, <laughs> it's totally depressing. So, I mean, in that regard, you know, especially now when you have a very politically polarized environment, my, pers my personal take would have been not to have cut it off and just, you know, let it run and people can look at it or they can not look at it. Just, you know, let it go and, and, you know, make it at your own risk sort of thing. So I would have personally left in that sort of context, but... I do understand that probably the level of policing needed even to maintain civility may have gotten to be just such an effort they just literally couldn't invest the expense yeah. to maintain yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, process yeah. of doing it. Yeah. So. The argument also often is that those people just start their own blogs. Yeah. That if they, wanna, if they really need to get out their yeah. opinion about this piece, they, should, they can get the blogs put up. Yeah, no, it's true. There, Lance Bennett, who I'm, I hope we can host here through this venue um, in the next year or two, is someone who's designed software exactly what Kathy was talking about, what she's doing with her MOOC, um, that uh, creates civil discourse by virtue of the moves you have to make. You know, what are you thinking about, um, and 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 what are the indications of lack of civil discourse? So he has a whole set of indicators of what lack of a lack of civil discourse will look like, and so I'm not saying that, but I am with Muhammad that I'd rather see discourse that needs to be made civil or more civil, but has a, in, built into the software is a minimum criteria for civility, in, and then move to the next level, which is more or less informed, and then you know to the next level and so on. Um, I think that we really should do that, and I think that's also something um, that we're hoping to teach students with this new grant that we have um, through the Baca Foundation where, um, we, we're, we're going to be training people not just to write every single Duke undergrad through the Thompson Writing Program, but also to speak and to engage online in a totally different way so the comments are not just, you know, out there and that that's the new Wild West, right? So. And also, I think this problem speaks to the way that most topics that we take up as academics could be addressed with multiple publics in productive ways. And the presumption shouldn't always be that the widest public is always the right public for the discussion you want to have. And that thinking about how to make those decisions in smart ways and where the openness can be productive, which could be partic out to particular non-academic communities, but not all non-academic communities, or across different kinds of academic groups, but making the choices and thinking about what's productive in each way could, could become more of a strategy that we could, we could learn. It's just really hard for us to know in advance who the potential right audience is. I mean, I remember when I first came to Duke, um, one of the first meetings I went to the library was getting started on a project to digitize the papyrus collection mm -hmm. here in, in the Special Collections Library, and uh, the late John Oates was the one who was I went to a conference with him, and there were a bunch of papyrologists there, and um, we're talking about putting these things on the internet. This was in 1995. The internet was a oh, new wow. thing. The web was a new mm -hmm. thing. It was one of the first digital library projects, and there was a, an eminent 
classicist from Germany who said, but if we make these things available on the internet, then people who are unqualified will read them. <laughs> and, <laughs> they had controlled access and you had, to, you had to ask for permission to see it and so on. And, and that, just, that just puzzled me. Um, and fortunately, it puzzled John Oates too, and he argued strongly against that, and we eventually put everything online. And, and, uh, but, you know, the person who's unqualified to read it is probably the person who you most want to read it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones who, who want to learn from it. And it, you know, it kind of troubles me that we'll, we'll self-select who we think oh, will benefit right. most from this right. um, in advance. Right. And I think there's a deep, <laughs> deep an analogy there with um, translation and the scholarly ambivalence to translation. So on the one hand, you know, my field, I was laughing, Mohammed, when you were talking about a year old, who wants to do that? In my field, if it's 50 years old, we still call it recent. So, you know, we're, but, but it, it, if you translate a Sanskrit text, then, you know, you, th that's a good thing that you do, but you get upset with other scholars who use the translation because it's not for, you know, it's for someone lower than you, right? <laughs> and I have a friend who's one of the best Sanskritists I know, he says, I always use really good translations because that's the point of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an analog to our attitude towards translation and our attitude towards the use of the net. Yeah. I, uh, I often tell a story, <clears throat> and maybe this is about you, Christina, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't remember no who it was. About many years ago when there were, it was like 2006 when there were all these universities banning the use of Wikipedia in research papers. Was it, was, was it you? And yeah. my organization, Haystack, decided to say, no, 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 don't ban it. Make that a teaching assignment. Instead of having your students write research papers, have them contribute better, mm -hmm. exactly, better public yeah. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, I just as a, because I was a math geek growing up, I looked up calculus online, in, on Wikipedia. And there was this crazy entry that had all this stuff about Persia and Iran and China and Turkey and India that, you know, it wasn't about Leibniz and Newton and the big fight about who really invented calculus. It was all these things that I'd never heard of before. And I called the library and I actually can't remember who I talked to and I, it wasn't you, and said, is this true? And I got a call back from the librarian saying, you know, there's not a single resource in our library that supports this, but I'm going to find out who the librarians are in those different countries and see what they know. And it turned out only one of the librarians in any of the countries knew about their national literature's contribution to calculus, but each one of them was a librarian. So they actually looked, and it took about a week or two weeks, but at the end, we were able to confirm everything about this other history of calculus on Wikipedia. But not a single librarian knew about anyone else's history, and most didn't even know about the history that was their national history, their national heritage to promote. So story. that made me understand that there is something about the non-expert that is so, and this goes back to your original question, that is so price precious, yeah. even to those who are you know, certified to be keepers of the guild and the knowledge of the guild, that the, the translation of knowledge is not one way, right? There is something so beneficial about the translation that comes back. It's not just that we give our knowledge to the public. We don't see so much that's out there and that so much is available. And uh, I think one of the things that's amazing about this open knowledge source and this world of open knowledge is how much, you know, that you can go to one source that doesn't have a hierarchy of taxonomy. So you can find about the 1972 Phillips VCR or your dad's diagnosis of pancreatic cancer or the history of calculus in, in one resource that doesn't say one counts as knowledge and one doesn't. And because it doesn't say one counts as knowledge and one doesn't, it has a different kind of access than we um, even define typically within the academy. That's, that's, pretty, that's the flip side of optimistic part of, the, of um, access to me. Yeah, it's a pretty, and every time I look at the calculus one, there's some new detail. Look at movable type. If you oh. want to see an interesting one, I've started to use movable type in my talks, and I swear, every time I go, someone has enough, and then the Koreans in 1027 came up with metal movi movable type, and you know, it's like every day, it seems like somebody's adding to that history. Wow. It's not Gutenberg anymore by any means. <laughs> Take one more question. Or not. <laughs> uh, so, I, you actually brought up at one point the downloading of music, and and then you, in, when you were speaking about not trying not to leave out the non-experts, and I'm thinking a lot of the questions 
that you all have addressed today are very applicable also to the world of popular music and music performance and downloading. Mm -hmm. And maybe that some of the, and I'm glad uh, yesterday I think the Fisk Jubilee Singers were here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that maybe one of the things that scholars need to look to is this other un, not expert, not academic group of people who have been dealing with this issue for maybe 10 more years than we have. Mm -hmm. their, their whole world's been really disrupted yeah. um, and their, their well, livelihood's really been undermined. I, I mean, I think, and Ken's a good person for this because, you know, he's a music person on the panel. Oh, okay. But, you know, this idea that there's a whole language around popular music and bootlegging. We never think about bootlegging books, <laughs> you know, which is a practice that's gone on for a very long time. Um, but it's only when it takes this kind of digital form that suddenly it becomes a crisis, you know, though very clearly it's been, ha been going on, you know, for a long time, as long as it's been technology to copy. <laughs> it was very interesting, the David Byrne piece in The Guardian, you probably saw, yeah. where he was talking about Spotify, so people are just... Uh, buying, perhaps you, are just <laughs> uh, subscribing to be able to listen to what you'd like to listen to on Spotify, which um, U.S. record labels were really against uh, long after it was very successful in Scandinavia and in the U.K. And they got paid off big time. They got huge advances on what they were going to earn. But the amount that artists got was very small, and he was naming you know, artists you would have heard of who are pretty successful, and if that was their only source of income, they'd be living on $13,000 a year. So it's like, oh, huh, why is it that creatives, whether scholars or musicians, are the people who should learn to live with less so that people can have creative products <laughs> for free, whereas, like, as Kathy often points out, AT&T isn't letting me download all that stuff for free. Right. Um, Apple isn't giving me a new phone every time <laughs> they decide my old one should be upgraded. You know, so that we're paying for a whole bunch of different things, and the one thing we don't want to pay for is creative production. It, so. it's, it's the Henrietta Lacks story, right? It right. It's the healer sale, yeah. right? You know, the fact that, you know, this woman selling, most of you know the healer story. I mean, the, the fact that her family did not benefit at all from this woman's body and her cells as intellectual property, though literally, right, there are hundreds of other hands, mm -hmm. you know, that have become wealthy on the use of this, and her, but her family doesn't have any access to that, right? And, and so I think, you know, Ken makes a, a, an important point, particularly if we think about the work that we do as scholars, as creatives, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that we're at the lowest level of the totem pole in some regards in terms of remuneration, financial remuneration for the work that we do. And it does bug me that it's musicians, artists, scholars that are the ones that are supposed to, whose information should be free and not Time Warner. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think, think the analogy fits all that well because, um, you know, talking about Time Warner, um, you know, there's plenty of people in this room right now who are on Wi-Fi devices, and we're not paying for access to the network because somebody, OIT or the provost or well, Tom and Trask, true, has decided yes. as a community, yes. us not having to pay for Wi-Fi unlocks a certain kind of activity Absolutely. that we want to encourage, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's we can, as a community, come together and decide I that agree. there are certain things that are in our interest. So I think right. um, in the scholarly communication, you know, public scholarly peer-reviewed articles is, is different than music because I think, um, well, for a couple of things. One is you're not expecting to get royalties typically for an article. You want um, attention, you want influence, impact, reputation. Those things, I'm presuming, are more important than the royalty on, on the article. And so they, what can we do and to... And the reality is that they, they translate into like speaking fees. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like so this. if we could maximize those things um, and get other public benefits, would we want to do that as a community? Mm -hmm. um, and, and my answer is resounding yes, as long as the, all the stakeholders are, in, are actually being fairly compensated. Absolutely. Think, Absolutely. The question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? Absolutely. Not whether, whether we should do that. And Absolutely. then the other piece is, is who actually controls the, the, the output that you're producing. So if you are handing over the ownership of your creative work, to someone else um, who then takes away the, the ownership from you and the control from you, and now they can decide where that's going to go, how much will be charged, whether right, you can use story. it yourself, how you can use it, how you can share it, 
now suddenly you've lost control over right. your own creation. Um, I don't think we want that, but that's the situation we're in right. now. And I think that's the situation a lot of musicians are in now, yes. mm -hmm. and they wish they weren't in that situation. Right. We should come up with something better than musicians have come up with. We really don't. No, I mean that. I mean, we should learn that lesson and take that to heart and come up with something that is better. No, I agree with that. I completely agree, Paolo. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you hadn't had a chance to see the space, do spend some time. There is both free wine and free food. <laughs> <laughs> and even some kittens, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>